I, I thought that was all automatic. But no. Okay. Uh, now, thank you. I'm, I'm delighted uh, all of you could join us this afternoon for the rollout of the Global Aging Preparedness Index. Um, I'm especially grateful to, uh, 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 to the two discussants who've uh, volunteered to, 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 to give their, their thoughts on the index and to um, um, am, am, amplify uh, 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 and, uh, and critique. Uh, Benedict Clements, who's uh, uh, Chief of the Expenditure Policy Division in the IMF's Fiscal Affairs Department, and Dalmer Hoskins, uh, who's currently um, Director of the Division of Program Studies at SSA uh, and until recently Secretary General of um, the International Social Security Association. Uh, I would be remiss if uh, also on behalf of CSIS um, I uh, uh, did not uh, express my gratitude to our financial sponsor, Prudential PLC, uh, uh, for its support of the uh, uh, project and also to its U.S. subsidiary, Jackson National Life Insurance. Um, I'll talk for uh, about 30 minutes. If, if I go longer, please start looking impatient and uncomfortable. And um, um, then I think probably the best way to do this is to turn immediately to the discussants, and then we should have roughly an hour for, for, for Q&A. And, Q and I mean, if, if there's a point that requires uh, sort of technical clarification, um, um, in other words, if I'm just plain old confusing, please feel free to interrupt and, and stop me. But for sort of matters of interpretation and so forth, maybe we could save that for the, uh, uh, for the, for the discussion. Very good. Um, the world stands on the threshold of a stunning demographic transformation brought about by falling fertility and rising longevity. It's called global aging, and it promises to reshape virtually every dimension of economic and social life. For most of human history, um, until well into the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century, the elderly, uh, here defined um, as adults aged 60 and over, uh, not, not because age 60, much less age 65, is, is the threshold of, of, of senescence um, or, or, or functional, uh, functional decline, but because in, in, in most countries in the index, in fact, it is rather close to the effect of retirement age. Um, so I'm just preempting criticism on that point. So the, the elderly, here defined as adults age 60 and over, only comprised a tiny fraction of the population, never more than 4 or 5 percent in any country. Um, in the developed world today, uh, they comprise um, a little more than 20 percent of the population. Three decades from now, in 2040, that share is on, tra on track to reach 30 percent, and that's just the average. In Japan and the fastest aging European countries, the elder share of the population will be approaching or even passing 40 percent. Now, the developing world as a whole is still much younger, but it too is aging, with some countries traversing the entire distance, demographic distance, from young and growing to old and stagnant or declining at a breathtaking pace. By 2040, Brazil and Mexico will be nearly as old as the United States and China will be older. Meanwhile, Korea will be vying with Germany, Italy, and Japan for the title of oldest country on Earth. We live in an era of many challenges, from global warming to global terrorism. But few are as certain as global aging, and few are as likely to have such a large and enduring um, an impact on the size and shape of government budgets, on the future growth and living standards, and on the stability of the global economy. Global aging promises to affect everything from business psychology and worker productivity to the structure of the family and the direction of global capital flows. Perhaps most fatefully, it could call into question the ability of societies to provide a decent standard of living for the old without imposing a crushing burden on the young. Now, up to 10 or 15 years ago, global aging barely registered as a policy issue. Today, it has become the focus of growing concern worldwide. Many governments are beginning to debate, and indeed some have enacted 
major reforms. Most of the concern, especially in the developed world, is focused on the rising fiscal cost of government benefit programs. Most developed countries have expensive pay-as-you-go public pension systems that were put in place in the early post-war decades when workers were abundant and retirees were scarce, but which have now been rendered or which are now being rendered increasingly unsustainable by the collapse in birth rates and the steady rise in longevity. Graying also means paying more for health care, a lot more for health care, um, because the elderly typically consume at least three times more per capita in medical services and at least ten times more per capita in long-term care services than the non-elderly. Meanwhile, in the developing world, countries are beginning to worry that they may grow old before they grow rich. Many developing countries, in fact, are aging before they've had time to put in place the social protections of a modern welfare state. In China, India, and Mexico, only a fraction of the workforce is earning any pension benefit, public or private, and the majority of elders still depend heavily on the extended family for support in old age. Yet the informal support networks on which elders depend are already under assault by the forces of modernization and will soon come under increasing demographic pressure as populations age and family size declines. Here the problem is not so much the growing burden on the young as the growing vulnerability of the old. Yet, um, despite the concern about global aging, there exists no satisfactory measure um, of how well countries worldwide, a satisfactory and comparable measure of how well countries worldwide are actually responding to the challenge. The purpose of the Global Aging Preparedness Index, or GAP Index for short, is to meet that need. Um, the index projections extend from 2007 through 2040 in order to capture the full impact of the demographic transformation now sweeping the world. The index covers 20 countries, including both developed economies and emerging markets. The overall gap index consists of two separate sub-indices, a fiscal sustainability index and an income adequacy index. The sub-indices, in turn, are based on indicators grouped into distinct categories, each dealing with a different dimension of the old age dependency challenge. Now, on the th th this is a little bit much to take in in the, the two minutes I'm going to have this slide up here, but it, it, it is in your summary, summary handout. Um, um, uh, the, on the fiscal side, the gap index begins by looking at projections of the total burden um, of old age, uh, uh, public burden of old age benefit spending, including both pensions and health, health benefits. But the index also goes further. It takes into account the differing fiscal room that countries have to accommodate the growth in old, old age benefits. It also considers the degree of elderly dependence on public benefits which may be a crucial factor in determining how politically easy or difficult um, it will be uh, to enact cost-saving reform or indeed to follow through on reforms that have already been enacted but not yet phased in. Let's begin by looking um, at the first public burden category and the benefit level and benefit growth indicators. Um, as you can see, today's emerging markets generally have low public burdens uh, compared with the fully developed economies, both because they have relatively young populations and because coverage under their public benefit systems is often far from universal. Old age benefits in most emerging markets are projected to grow substantially over the next few decades. Um, nearly doubling by 2040 in India, nearly tripling in China, and quadrupling in Korea. Even so, only Brazil, um, where, the, where they are projected to reach, uh, where is Brazil? 20% of GDP um, will rank among the 10 highest burden countries in 2040. The developed countries generally have much higher burdens, although here too, uh, uh, there's a wide range of outcomes. Uh, 
The differences are due in part to demographics and in part to the ver varying generosity of benefit systems, especially pensions. The lower burden English-speaking countries um, both spend, and, and, and here, I don't know if we have any Canadians, but, but Canada is classified uh, as an English-speaking country, um, which gets me into trouble uh, in, 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 in Montreal. Um, but the lower burden English-speaking countries both spend less per capita on old age benefits and are due to age less. The higher burden countries of continental Europe generally have the most expensive public old age benefit systems and also the fastest aging populations. Japan is a special case. It faces a massive age wave, but its pension benefits are already less than generous and are scheduled to be reduced even further in the future. Um, a few countries, notably Korea and the United States, score much better on benefit level, the first indicator we were looking at, than on benefit growth. In the case of Korea, the explanation lies mainly in its unusually severe demographics. Between 2004 and 24, I'm sorry, 2007 and 2040, the elderly share of Korea's population is due to rise from 14% to 39%, by far the largest increase of any country in the index. The United States, in contrast, faces a relatively benign demographic future. The generosity of its public pension system, um, um, Social Security in other words, is also modest by developed world standards. What gives the United States its 15th place ranking on benefit growth is its exceptionally rapid rate of growth in health benefit spending. Not a big surprise. Um, there are also a number of countries that score significantly better on growth than on level, notably Sweden, Germany, Japan, Italy, and France. All have enacted reforms that are scheduled to cut average public pension benefits relative to average wages over the next few decades. These countries spend a lot on old age benefits today, and they're going to spend even more tomorrow, but total spending will grow mu much less than the aging of their populations would other otherwise require. Um, and and, and I, I say much less uh, 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 advisedly. One of the things we do in the, in the index is to compare current law projections with what we call a current deal projection. Um, and, and the current deal projection uh, calculates what the cost of the system would be um, if people continued to retire at the same average age they do today and if average benefits remained, average per capita benefits remained unchanged relative to the average per worker wages. Um, and the current law projection for France is 33 percent less than the current deal projection as a share of GDP, that a third. Uh, Germany and Italy, 36% less, and Japan, 42% less. So these are very large relative benefit cuts, um, um, not always well advertised to the public, uh, uh, built into current law in these countries. Now, the benefit level and benefit growth indicators both add, um, we believe, an important perspective to the index. The absolute spending level as a share of GDP is, is clearly the simplest measure of the total resource burden. Um, of, aging, of aging populations. Yet the rise in spending is also important since some societies may be institutionally and culturally better equipped to handle high levels of public benefit spending in large public sectors than others. From this perspective, the road ahead for a United States or a Korea may be as bumpy um, as for some countries that are projected to spend much more. Now, uh, while a, a large and growing fiscal burden um, is certainly a cause for concern. The magnitude of the burden alone doesn't tell us whether it's sustainable. It's also crucial to look at the fiscal room that different countries have available to accommodate the burden. Um, and there are three ways in which a country can accommodate a rising fiscal burden. You can raise taxes, you can cut other spending, or you can borrow, or do some of all. Um, the tax option is clearly unsustainable in most developed countries, particularly uh, in, in, in most European countries. At some point, rather than generate new revenue, higher tax rates may simply slow economic growth, exacerbate unemployment, um, and push more workers into a growing gray economy. 
Um, the tax op option may also prove unsustainable in some emerging markets. Most start with relatively small public sectors and so would seem to have an advantage. This advantage may be more apparent than real, however, since many have large informal sectors which by definition cannot be taxed. Um, while developed countries may have difficulty pushing the total tax burden much above 50 percent of GDP, developing countries may have difficulty pushing it much above 40 percent of GDP. Did I jump too far ahead here? Yeah. Okay. Fair. Did I have the tax indicator slide up at all? Yeah. I did? Very briefly. Very briefly. It, it, it's essentially just the, the current government, re total government revenue uh, at all levels of government as a share of GDP, um, um, plus the projected growth in old age benefit spending. Um, to, to the extent that taxes cannot be raised, countries may be able to accommodate the growing burden by reducing other categories of government spending. In other words, by cannibalizing the rest of the budget. Um, the budget room indicator points to some useful policy lessons. Countries with large public sectors but relatively small old age dependency burdens tend to have much more budget room than tax room. So you know, take, take a Sweden, which is the most striking instance. The implication um, is that such countries may be able to carve out a lot of extra space in their budgets for old age benefit programs. Um, since presumably they can find a lot of lower priority government spending uh, which can be caught without, cut without much cost to society. Uh, on the other hand, countries with relatively small public sectors like Japan and the United States may be able to accommodate relatively little growth in old age benefit spending without crowding out vital public services. Now the final option, um, at least in theory, is to pay for rising old age benefit costs by borrowing. Um, except in a few emerging markets, this just isn't a real-world option. Uh, if, if governments were to simply borrow to cover the projected year-to-year -year growth in old-age benefit spending, uh, 11 of the 20 index countries would have a net debt exceeding 100 percent of GDP by 2040, and six would have a net debt <coughs> exceeding 150 percent of GDP. Uh, this last high-debt group includes not just high-benefit growth countries like Brazil and Spain, but also the UK and the United States, which have already used up most of whatever borrowing room we had uh, during the economic crisis. Um, and I, I, I think this, this slide in particular uh, uh, is something that uh, uh, Benedict may come back to. Um, but let, let me just note that, that these projections um, are designed to isolate the impact uh, of the growth in old age benefit programs alone on the public debt level. They assume um, that in the rest of government budget, countries will run a debt neutral fiscal policy. I don't want to burden, burden the presentation here with the technical uh, discussion of what debt neutrality means, but, 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 but essentially, you know, countries, countries, you know, take their fiscal medicine and get the rest of the budget stabilized, and then we just look at the impact if you borrow dollar for dollar or euro for euro to pay for the, the rising cost of old age benefits. Obviously, if we were to relax this assumption, cu cu countries spin off the charts much, much sooner. Um, now, how big is the risk that countries with large and growing old age benefit burdens won't be able to make the necessary adjustments until they hit the fiscal wall? Uh, just as important, how big is the risk that countries which have made significant progress in curbing future cost growth um, will have to roll back the reforms when they begin to cut deeply into benefit payments and elderly living standards? Clearly, one factor that will help or hinder reform is the degree to which the elderly in different countries are dependent on public benefits. Um, so this brings us to the benefit dependence indicator. And, and as you can see, the level of dependence uh, in most countries is quite high. Uh, it's worth noting, moreover, that these figures underestimate the absolute level of dependence of most elders, since they are averages for all elders, including the affluent. Um, 
Even in countries with relatively low benefit dependence, the figures for elders in the middle of the income distribution are much higher. Uh, th this particular indicator we include in the index includes the cash value of health benefits. Um, um, but, but if we switch just to cash income, um, it, in the United States, the shares for the average elder are, it, for, for, for cash benefits, um, uh, the, the public benefit share is 22 percent, but for the median, in other words, the third quintile of the income distribution, is 38 uh, percent. For Japan, 39 percent versus 61. For the UK, 42 percent versus 69. In France, Germany, Italy, and Spain, more than 70 percent of the cash income of the typical elder arrives in the form of a government check, suggesting that some of the countries that may most need uh, well, they indeed do most need uh, uh, to make benefit reductions in the future, may f have the most difficulty doing so. Now, al although the overall level of benefit dependence is probably the single best indicator of potential political resistance to cost-cutting reform, the reliance of the low-income elderly on public benefits may also be an important factor. Um, we, we therefore include a benefit cut indicator in the index that measures the percentage of elderly households that would be pushed into poverty by a given, in, in this case, 10 percent cut in public benefits. Not surprisingly, the countries that do best on this indicator are generally those in which overall benefit dependence is low. In India, Mexico, or Korea, you could zero out all public benefits without significantly increasing elderly poverty. Um, the countries that do worse generally have expansive welfare states. In Sweden, Germany, or the Netherlands, with their higher degree of benefit dependence, any given percentage cut in benefits translates into a larger percentage cut in total household income. There are also some quirky results here, which, which if you want to press me on, we can come back to in the Q&A. Um, okay. Aging preparedness is as much about ensuring income adequacy as fiscal sustainability. On the adequacy side, the GAAP index tracks the level of and trend in the living standard of the elderly relative to the non-elderly in each country based on income projections that factor in the impact of changes in public benefit programs, private pension provision, and labor force participation rates. Um, it also includes indicators that measure the robustness of old age safety nets and family support networks. Um, the, the first two indicators uh, look at total income um, and total income trend. Uh, that is the chain, the percentage change uh, in total income um, between 2007 and 2040. And, 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 and here, just to be clear, we are using a relative income measure. We're looking at the income, uh, per capita income of the old relative to the per capita income of the young. Um, and what's most striking about the total income of the elderly, uh, frankly, is how high it is in today's developed countries. The elderly in most country, developed countries are indeed quite well off uh, compared with the young, much more so than they were a generation ago. Um, but the very high ratios uh, for this indicator are also explained by two additional factors. First, the measure of total income used in the index includes the cash value of government health benefits. Um, and as I've already noted, per capita, the elderly consume much more in health care than the non-elderly. Second, the ratios refer to after-tax income. And in most developed countries, the non-elderly bear a disproportionate share of the total tax burden both because payroll taxes fall much more heavily on the young and because public and, in some countries, private pension benefits uh, 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 frequently enjoy favorable tax treatment. So the relative living standard uh, of the elderly is generally lower uh, in developing countries um, and, in some cases, much lower. Uh, the two big exceptions of Brazil and Chile, uh, uh, which not only have large contributory <coughs> contributory pension systems by developing world standards, um, but also uh, <coughs> universal poverty floors. Um, um, in Brazil, that's been in place for more than a decade now. In Chile, uh, uh, it's more recent, um, but that is built into the projections. As it uh, turns out, there's considerable overlap in the rankings for the total income uh, and total, total income level and total income trend uh, or growth indicators.
Uh, there are, however, some significant differences. France, Japan, and Italy have average rankings on total income level, but very low rankings on total income trend, 1718 and 19 respectively. The main reasons for the downward trend, large scheduled cuts in current law public pension benefits, combined with relatively little growth in private pensions or elderly labor force participation. While the, while the total income category tracks society's overall, how society's overall economic resources are shared between younger and older generations, the income vulnerability category tracks the relative living standard of middle class elders, if you will, uh, a, a group whose overall income will be much more affected by changes in the generosity of retirement systems. Um, it also takes into account the degree of elderly poverty in each country. Uh, as you can see, the ratios of elderly to non-elderly income are significantly lower for the median than for the total, uh, the total income measure, in part because the median income measure excludes public health benefits. Here, here we, we just want to look at a cash measure which better captures most people's understanding of their, their, their own living standard. Um, nonetheless, the relative uh, living standard of the middle class elderly is still quite high in most countries. In 2040, the ratio of the median elderly to non-elderly income is projected to be above 0.9 in 10 countries and above 1.0 in four. In another six countries, the ratio is projected to be between 0.7 and 0.9. And most retirement planners would consider a retirement e income equal to 70% uh, of pre-retirement income adequate and a retirement income equal to 90% or higher excellent. Um, in only four countries, Russia, Mexico, Korea, and China, are the median elderly projected to have incomes that seem unusually low relative to the non-elderly. Uh, the more important story, however, may be told by the trend indicator. The median income trend indicator is negative in more countries than the total income trend indicator, and the projected declines are also larger. Part of the explanation is that the total income measure is buoyed up by rapid growth in health benefits, but part is also that the relative living standard of the median elderly suffers much more than the living standard of the average elderly when the growth in per capita pension benefits fails to keep pace with the growth in per capita wages. So the income prospects of middle class elders may have especially important implications for the future direction of policy changes. I, the UK, um, um, to, cite, to cite a striking instance, has already discovered this. You know, back in the early 1980s, it switched the indexation of its basic state uh, uh, pension um, from wages to prices, effectively flattening long-term projected cost growth as a share of GDP and prompting policy analysts around the world, including myself, to note that the UK was the only developed country that had solved its long-term aging problem. Well, um, as price indexing caused benefits to decline steadily as a share of wages, calls for repeal of the reform grew. And in 2007, and amid an emerging consensus that continuing on that path would impoverish the elderly, they reversed direction and reinstituted wage indexing. Um, so I mean, it's possible to solve the projections, uh, to solve the projections without solving the problem. Um, and, and, and in my view, that, that's the case in, in, in a number of uh, European countries uh, uh, today. Um, along with the living standard of middle class elders, the degree of elderly poverty is clearly an important dimension of overall income adequacy. Um, here we're looking at the stan standard relative poverty measure used in, in cross-country comparisons. Um, this isn't an official poverty line measure. Uh, it's the share of the elderly with an income less than 50% of the median for all people, uh, for, 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 for people of all ages. Um, as one would expect, the Anglo-Saxon countries generally have higher poverty rates than the continental European countries and the emerging markets generally have the highest rates of all. The big surprise is Brazil, whose extraordinarily low rate, just 5%, is a testament to the success of its old age poverty floor. In Mexico, which is a similarly skewed income distribution, but no universal floor of old age poverty projection, the poverty rate is five times as high. 
The final category um, looks at an important dimension of income security not fully captured elsewhere in the index, um, namely the extent to which the elderly may be able to rely on the support of their extended families. Uh, there are two indicators in the category. Uh, the first is the share of all elderly who now live in extended families with their adult children. Um, and the second is the projected change in the average number of surviving children of the elderly uh, from 2007 to 2040. <clears throat> that was fun to calculate, Nick. Um, as you can see, uh, the share of the elderly who live with their grown children is generally much higher in the emerging markets than in the developed countries, although uh, a couple of countries, uh, Japan, Spain, and Italy, um, also have high levels of multi-generational living. Multi-generational living can constitute an important advantage uh, in confronting the aging challenge. It not only allows relatively poor elders to live with their more affluent children, um, it also allows relatively poor young adults uh, to live with their more affluent parents. Um, something which may be familiar to a phenomenon that may be familiar to some uh, in the audience today. Um, it mitigates the old age dependency burden not just by providing an extra source of support for the old, but by providing a form of trickle down support for the young as well. Um, the young, of course, can provide support to the old in many ways, uh, even if they don't actually live with them. Uh, uh, you know, in, 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 in particular, in-kind personal care. Um, the family size indicator, uh, which again looks at the, the change in the average number of surviving children of the typical uh, uh, elder, um, reveals that, the inf that these informal support networks on which elders uh, uh, depend will soon come under intense demographic pressure in many developing countries. <coughs> Excuse me. In China, the average number of surviving children per elder is projected to decline by 1.6 between 2007 and 2040, in Brazil by 1.7, in Korea by 1.8, and in Mexico by an enormous 2.5. Um, well, it's time to wrap up and just take a uh, quick look at the overall results. Um, the GAP index, I think, contains uh, some good news and some bad news. You always want a good news, bad news story. Uh, the bad news um, is that very few countries score well on both sustainability and adequacy. Three of the seven highest ranking countries on the fiscal sustainability index, Mexico, China, and Russia, um, are among the seven lowest ranking countries on the income adequacy index. Four of the seven highest ranking countries on the income adequacy index, the Netherlands, Brazil, Germany, and the UK, are among the seven lowest ranking countries on the fiscal sustainability index. And clearly there's a trade-off going on here. Huh? Um, there are also two countries, France and Italy, that score near the bottom of both indices. Both have legislated large prospective cuts in the generosity of their public pension systems that threaten to erode the living standard of the old, <coughs> Yet despite the cuts, their benefit systems remain so costly that they will impose a large and rising burden on the young. <coughs> the good news is that there are exceptions. Australia, <coughs> um, this is the point at which an assistant is supposed to rush in with a glass of water. <coughs> The good news is that there are exceptions. Australia, which combines a low-cost, means-tested floor of public old-age poverty project protection with a large mandatory and fully funded private pension system, scores in the top half of both indices. <coughs> Several other countries, moreover, are clearly moving in the right direction. Like France and Italy, Germany and Sweden have scheduled deep reductions um, in the future generosity of their public pension systems. But unlike France and Italy, they are on track to fill in the resulting gap in elderly income by increasing funded pension savings and by extending work lives. Um, although their fiscal burdens remain high, they have been cut well beneath what they would otherwise be without undermining adequacy. Clearly, 
global aging poses a daunting, thank you, KSK, a daunting um, economic and social challenge. Many fast aging countries, especially in the developed world, seem to face a difficult choice between relieving the growing fiscal burden on the young um, and maintaining adequate incomes for the old. Meanwhile, in many developing countries, the choice seems to be just the opposite, whether to impose a new fiscal burden um, on the young in order to relieve the growing vulnerability of the old. Yet just as clearly, there are many um, strategies available to address the challenge. The GAP Index includes a reform guide that assesses the urgency and potential payoff of seven key reform strategies from reducing pension benefits and health care cost growth to increasing fertility rates and immigration. Um, during, during the q and I'd, I'd be happy to um, um, you know, discuss the strategies uh, uh, and also to, to explain um, the metrics we use to divide countries into different priority groups. But I, 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 need to, I need to wrap up now, so let me just note um, that in our view, two strategies in particular, extending work lives and increasing funded retirement savings are especially important since they allow countries to escape or at least to mitigate uh, the trade-off between fiscal sustainability and income adequacy. Um, they are, in fact, uh, uh, the principal means and, and, and perhaps the only means, practical means, by which aging countries can maintain or improve uh, the adequacy of income for the old without imposing a new tax or family burden um, on, on the young. And I, I, I had some sort of uh, purple prose, just conclu prose conclusion, but I'm going to, to forego that and uh, uh, pass, pass it off directly to you, Ben. Thank you. very much. Um, I think I'm going to speak just about f five to ten minutes to leave enough time for the uh, next presenter in our discussion. Um, let's see if I can move this forward with the... Do we have the numbers lock on or something? Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. I mean, what I'm going to talk about in terms of an overview of the comments is the simply, first I'll talk a little bit about the, the index. Uh, and generally, we feel it really does make a valuable contribution. Uh, secondly, and talk about how the projection increases in age-related spending, whether they're uh, consistent, broadly in line with what we've been projecting at the IMF, and number three, uh, talk a bit about this fiscal room indicator, which we kind of think is an area where it would be useful to have a further discussion. Uh, first, uh, in terms of the, the index, and we really think it makes a, quite a valuable contribution. Which, first of all, just calling attention to the aging problem and the fiscal cost of this is very welcome. Big theme at the IMF has been that with the financial, uh, the aftermath of the uh, global financial crisis and the fiscal consequences, Countries face very serious long-term problems, and we very much welcome this attention to these, to these uh, problems. Uh, we also think it's very useful to look at both the, this issue of fiscal sustainability and the adequacy of, of systems uh, is quite a valuable uh, approach and helps draw attention to this issue of are systems adequate to uh, uh, achieve objectives of long-term income protection for the elderly. Uh, also, in terms of the policy recommendation, is very consistent with one of the themes we've been pushing in, in our own work, is that the best solution going forward is going to be to raise retirement ages. There's just no way around it. Life expectancy is increasing. Many countries, retirement ages have not gone up. Where we see systems are in best shape is where there's some kind of indexation, uh, the retirement age to life expectancy. 
and so therefore we very much welcome the policy re recommendations here. Uh, what I wanted to do then is then move on say to the uh, more to the second point about how do we also see the health and uh, pension spending going forward uh, in terms of where we see uh, pension spending going forward there's been an awful lot of work done of course by the European Commission looking at European countries um, and we also in what I cite below is a uh, paper we did for our executive board uh, last year looking at countries country by country projections this is in the in the handout and generally what you see if you look at pensions is not as much an area of concern as as health which we'll go to next that is many countries as Richard has indicated have undergone a lot of pension reforms in which replacement rates will go down or they have done taken steps to increase retirement ages so when we look at say this PPP say a weighted country average of where we think pension spending is going it's only going to go up let's say about one percentage point of GDP on average over the next 30 years so generally on pensions we see countries have actually taken a lot of steps of course there are differences here and as Richard mentioned some emerging economies such as Brazil they may look in good shape in the next 20 years after that they actually have quite serious problems but the interesting thing here is we don't find that pensions is the major area of concern it will contribute to spending pressures but not as much as if you look at health on health this is the real concern for that is on the basis of current policies just running the demographics and assuming a, a increase in say average costs or, uh, excess cost growth consistent with historical averages you're going to have spending going up four percentage points of GDP so this is a huge huge fiscal challenge uh, and you can see in the United States very the leader in terms of the uh, increase in spending uh, for a lot of these spending increases we for our own estimates where they were not available we did our own projections but for others this is based on the European Commission's aging report projections but an important caveat using one of their scenarios that's called a that has a more realistic assumption about excess cost growth one of the problems is that European Commission's baseline scenario assumes that excess cost growth is practically zero that is which is a very optimistic assumption relative to the historical track record when they look at the next 20 years they get spending increases of the order of about less than one percentage point of GDP over the next 20 years whereas if you assume excess cost growth in their in their scenario in their more which is more consistent with their own econometric work you come up with uh, estimates that are over the next 20 years of spending increases of about three percentage points of GDP here push it to 30 years four percentage points of GDP so how do our projections line up with what's done here with the uh, with the uh, gap index report um, pretty consistent in terms especially on health on health we're looking at all health spending and as opposed to the uh, the gap index is looking instead at health spending for the elderly but pretty high correlation on on the health side where there's some differences and I think it might be useful in the report to kind of elaborate on some of the increases seem fairly large on the pension side on, on Brazil and Spain for example we are taking European Commission figures which, which seem quite uh, sensible so some where there's some different there's a high correlation with the uh, we, we better cost. look into Spain because we're taking the European Commission figures too. okay <laughs> all right so we are uh, somehow we had uh, so the, the figures seem to be a little bit uh, seemed a bit higher than ours but in general the story is different what's always difficult in these projections for the emerging economies is the assumption about coverage is coverage going to expand or not if you look at a country like India China, they've had robust economic growth the last say 15 years they have an increased health spending hardly at all to GDP so it's very hard to know when coverage is going to expand and with the economy growing rapidly you can inc have rapid increases in real spending without inc changing spending to GDP ratios so the picture here is there's a lot of similarity then but some especially on the pension side some differences we uh, be useful to elaborate on 
Uh, okay, now moving then to this issue of the uh, fiscal gap or the fiscal room projections. Here's where, in some ways, the story is what I want to discuss is that we think maybe countries have less fiscal room than what's indicated in the index and that our ranking of which countries have the least fiscal room to deal with aging problems differs a bit. I mean, as a precursor for this, this is just looking at what our projections are for government debt to GDP over gross the next few years. Debt. Pardon? Gross debt or net debt? Gross debt. This is gross debt to GDP on a weighted average basis. You can see it in the economic crisis for the emerging economies is it has not had that large an effect in the sense of now the fiscal positions are such and with their growth profiles, debt to GDP ratios are expected to decline. In the advanced economies, this is where the problem is that even under, based on current policies, our latest projection and and based on on our projections of fiscal positions, debt to GDP ratios are going to rise. So, so in a lot of ways, we feel countries are approaching the aging problem now with a big hole. And I know, as Richard said, is under their approach, they're trying to isolate the effect of age-related spending by, with the debt neutrality assumption. But here, an alternative perspective could be that a lot of countries don't have room just to deal with aging problems. They have to fix the other, the underlying situation first to have more room to, to deal with the uh, uh, aging. Here is kind of more of a complicated chart where the, the bottom line here, I'll come to a story that we really think it's the countries in the upper right-hand corner that really are in the worst shape and that this probably is the best way to think about uh, the fiscal sustainability or the kind of fiscal room story. Uh, this, what this is saying is that what we did is an exercise of thinking of what kind of fiscal adjustment would countries need between now and say 2030 in order to bring debt back close to the uh, pre-crisis median of about 60 percent of GDP. So this is kind of then saying based on who's in rough shape, who, who needs to make the biggest adjustment. So under this perspective, if you look on this x-axis, this is saying Japan, Ireland, the United States, the United Kingdom have very large adjustments they have to do if they were trying to get back to, if they were going to get to 60 percent. This is the change in their primary balance they'd have to do. This would say that, that in the United States then you're saying over 10 percentage points of GDP of fiscal adjustment just to make sure that then the debt by 2030 would come down to say to 60 percent of GDP. Now, the y-axis, this is looking at age-related spending that's going to go up in the next 20 years. And this would mean that in addition, you would have to take steps to offset age-related spending increases. So this is, if we look at pension and health spending in the United States, we're saying this is also close to six percentage points of GDP. So what we're saying is to achieve that objective, you would, in the United States, would need fiscal adjustment not only here on on, on the x-axis here, uh, the primary balance, but take steps to offset the underlying increase in, in uh, age-related spending. So, um, so th this generally is the uh, point I wanted to make regarding the mm -hmm. fiscal room that perhaps countries have even less room, which I think is why then in the end this exercise uh, that's being done is uh, very welcome to kind of call attention to some of these, uh, some of this uh, this this challenge the countries face and that that it may be that it's even a bigger issue than as being underscored in the report thank you Th thank you very much um, it, it it just pure, purely in terms of you know positioning oneself on the issue I'd, 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 I'd ra ra rather be having the IMF telling me I'm too conservative <laughs> than that I'm <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm way, up, way, way, way out there. Thank you very much for your comments. Well, I'm sure you're all dying to raise questions to Richard and his, his team. So I'm going to move right along here. I just wanted to say that um, this is not an easy report, and um, 
I probably wouldn't have read the whole thing unless you put me on the spot here, <laughs> particularly the technical part, which is uh, really one you have to do with a hot towel and a double scotch. Um, <laughs> but it, uh, it, it, it took that to write it. It too? Okay. <laughs> But I encourage you to dip into it and look at it closely because it's one of those reports that really makes you rearrange your thinking a lot. Um, I know that um, I was delighted to see that France doesn't come out on top like it usually does. <laughs> They're always the winner on being the happiest uh, and so forth, but they not so hot in this report. Um, we use Japan as the poster child of the doomsday future, but it's, Japan is not as, as badly off as Korea and uh, some other countries. Uh, and in particular, there's a real contribution in this report with respect to casting light on some developing countries. Because countries like India, which is, are doing nothing virtually uh, to take care of a rising aging population, are going to be in very deep trouble. And I was very sort of uh, disturbed uh, by how low Mexico comes out in this report, our neighbor, which uh, with uh, poverty rates five times higher than Brazil is a cause for a real geopolitical concern in my view. Uh, now, of course, I'm going to quibble because that's what I'm supposed to do, right? Mm -hmm. um, and those of you who are old hands at this international comparison game will probably have a little doze off now. But um, there are problems in categorizing countries' public pension systems. What is public and what is private? Now, you put a lot of countries into the private group because they're mandatory, they're private accounts, they're individually mandated and so forth. I probably would quibble with that because countries like the Netherlands, Sweden, Switzerland, to me, they're almost, if not all, public because they are, workers are required by law to contribute to them. They don't have any choice. The government regulates everything in these programs from the return of, uh, rate to the administrative costs. And so I'm not so sure that it's so easily with this public-private uh, distinction. And it would be interesting, Richard, to know if we played around with that, how your index would change. Uh, with some of these countries. The other issue for me is what about tax deductions? They're very expensive for governments to pay for. Uh, how do you factor that in? And of course, that kicker of all, are we going to be richer and more able to pay for these things in the future? What are we predicting? Uh, there are very divided opinions about that, I think. Now, of course, everyone grabs a report and looks for their favorite country, which probably means all of you in the room looked for the U.S., right? So did I. Uh, and I'm not sure, Richard, in the end of the day, where we come out. Uh, because you can see in your chart here about <coughs> expenditures for the elderly, we're not so bad. We're kind of in the middle. We're not in those uh, really generous countries but we've got some neighbors who are awfully suspicious with India, Mexico, and so forth. Um, we certainly are not in the top group where taxes are concerned, so you would, um, I'm not sure Benedict would agree with me, but there seems to be some room for tax change in the United States uh, because we aren't among the highly taxed of the world. However, this table is quite disturbing because I think quite rightly in this report, they measure poverty as 50% of the medium income, which of course all of you in this room know is not the way we do it officially in the United States. But here we don't do so well in the United States where we have over 20% of the elderly living in poverty. And other countries also come out surprisingly high, um, even countries like Switzerland which uh, we think of as a very generous country with respect to all these benefits, has quite an impressive level of poverty. So all in all, we get to your gap index, and the U.S. comes out pretty well as far as adequacy. Mm -hmm. So you need to explain that a little bit more to us, particularly um, countries like Russia, and, and I see Nick over there, don't look so bad. but. I'm surprised that Russia would be anywhere near Switzerland. So this table, I think, causes us some R concern. Russia's down at 15. Huh? Russia's 15. Switzerland is 14. Right. 
I hardly think they're neighbors in respect to protection of older people. But um, that's why we like this report. You have to keep reading to figure it out. Now, there's one uh, statement that I'm going to take real exception to, and Richard stated it in his oral address too, and that's where we get into what we, some of us would call the politics of Social Security. Because the report says most developed countries have expensive pay-as-you-go pension systems which have now become or are being rendered unsustainable. Now, I take a little bit the opposite view in the sense that I'm impressed by the Swedens, the Germanys, uh, France, which just passed a law in November, which considerably uh, ensures uh, the solvency of the French uh, pension system up to 2024 now. Uh, bravo to Mr. Sarkozy, I have to say. So I, I am much more impressed by the kind of the flexibility of countries in addressing these, these uh, public pension systems. Now this is not uh, anything new, and I put this quote up here in order to give us a little sense of modesty. Uh, Social Security assumes that Americans are irresponsible. It assumes that old age pensions are necessary because Americans lack the foresight to provide for their old age. The Social Security law is unjust, unworkable, stupidly drafted, and wastefully financed. Now guess who said that? I see Commissioner Hardy here and the Deputy Commissioner of Social Security doing enough. You're going to kill me. Uh, it's uh, Alf Landon. Uh, which just shows you that this debate has been going on for some time. We have been trying to reach a consensus about Social Security and about private savings for some time, and I guess it's going to go on for some time in the future. Uh, now, what worries me at this point in time is one of your seven strategies and your heavy emphasis on the importance of better retirement savings through mandated private individual accounts. And I think we all agree that we're in favor of uh, adopting and promoting multi-pillar systems. However, I would contend that we have reached a real crossroads in the world, and we are in a kind of a state of a crisis. If you just look at what is happening in Eastern Europe, Hungary has just nationalized the second pillar scheme. Uh, Argentina did it before. There is incredible interference in Slovakia, in the Czech Republic, in Romania, in Bulgaria, mm -hmm. as governments are finding it very difficult to pay for the first pillar and the second pillar at the same time. And so they're forcing people back into the first pillar. Now, I would think that this is a very confusing and dangerous public policy situation to be in. I don't know what the average worker in these countries thinks about where their pension is going to come from in the future. Uh, this is not good. The other issue that I think we have to address in promoting that strategy is the fact that people have very small accounts. This is the case for 401ckS in the United States. And in a country like Australia, if I get my little figure here, the average level of an account in Australia is only $25,000. So although Australia comes up pretty well in the adequacy index, I think it masks the fact that there are huge disparities in how much people are saving in these accounts. A country like Chile, which is considered really a leader, uh, only 60% of the workforce is contributing on a regular basis. 40% of women uh, contribute. So there are real problems of uh, people having a sustained activity over the lifetime uh, to put into these funds. And I think we have not learned all the lessons yet that we need to about how you pay out these benefits. The annuity markets, uh, administrative costs, uh, these remain very largely unaddressed. We spend a lot of time talking about what a great idea multi-pillar systems is, but we don't spend very much time talking about how we pay out uh, to these countries. And the most uh, sort of pessimistic view that I've heard recently comes out of countries like uh, Netherlands, which came up very, very high in this list, um, Switzerland, which are talking about the long-run return of their pension funds. 
And the Dutch are the first country that has taken steps to actually reduce bene pension benefits to current beneficiaries uh, from the uh, individual mm -hmm. schemes. Because of the low interest rates that are prevailing uh, in all of these countries. So we've got a lot of work to do if we're going to promote this as one of the principal strategies. Um, now, all this uh, leads me to one of my favorite topics, but no one wants to listen to it. Uh, and that is, whatever happened to develop a national policies on aging? That means your, all seven of your strategies have to be pulled together into a comprehensive, coherent uh, kind of approach. Few countries have it. Some have tried. I put Australia up here because remember Mr. Rudd? He did it. He issued the report and his government fell because one of the recommendations is they needed more immigrants to pay for the aging population. Well, that didn't meet the uh, the uh, preferences of the voters, and so he, he is no longer prime minister. But I liked one word that you use very much, and I intend to use it a lot in the future when I do these comments, if I'm ever asked again, and that is perceptions. We used to call it the politics of Social Security, but you've coined a new phrase, I think, and that is changing public perceptions. Very clever. Uh, because I think uh, what we're talking about here is political leadership. And it means that we have to have uh, governments who actually tackle these problems. Um, and my final conclusion is, as on the basis of your report, I'm actually moving in with my adult children. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Let, let me just take two, two, two minutes to respond to a few of the more more technical points, steering clear of the, the, the more perhaps uh, political ones, which, which we can delve into in the discussion if you, <clears throat> if, 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 if you like. Um, uh, the, the, the big difference, the, the, the difference on the health care side uh, uh, between the IMF, hmm? sure. Okay. The uh, uh, difference on, on, on the health care side, um, um, we, we, we actually uh, assume a convergence across countries and excess cost growth over, over time to the long-term average for all countries. Um, um, so, so we're not, we're, 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 we're not simply cr cr cranking out in each country. Um, and I, 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 I can talk about the justification for that, that assumption. But our excess cost growth assumption uh, for some countries, in particular the United States and, 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 and a few others, would be significantly lower than the IMFs. Um, um, the, 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 the point on, on the debt room indicator is, 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 is perfectly well taken. I, I, I couldn't agree more that, that, that you know, at the actual sort of economic and policy juncture uh, we're at today, uh, most countries and, and and particularly the, the Anglo-Saxon countries have less fiscal room, uh, 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 particularly less borrowing room um, than the gap index projections would, would, would indicate. But um, um, the, the metric we developed, as, as, as Benedict explained, uh, uh, served a different, a different purpose. Um, in, in terms of the categorization of public versus private, uh, we, the fundamental criterion uh, we were looking at was funded or versus pay as you go, um, um, a, a, as opposed to the uh, per particular institutional arrangement or or or, or nomen, nomenclature. Uh, tax expenditures uh, extremely important. Uh, that's for the uh, second edition. Uh, we'll think about how to uh, 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 how to build that into the. Uh, 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 build that into the, the, the model. Um, um, I, I, I would note, yeah, there, there has been uh, uh, a significant amount of interference uh, lately in ostensibly uh, uh, personally owned uh, 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 funded pension systems, which presumably would enjoy some kind of property right protection. Uh, the nationalization in Argentina and now in, 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 in Hungary. I mean, that, that, that does sort of undercut one of the arguments for, for funded uh, 
uh, uh, savings. Um, into the, the, it, it's of, often, I've argued, to the extent that it is funded and personally owned or contractually guaranteed, um, it's more likely uh, to be economically real um, um, than if it's simply a memo account within a government budget, uh, uh, for in, you know, such as the U.S. Social Security Trust Fund. Um, so that, that's certainly something that bears uh, uh, further, uh, uh, further consideration. To clarify, I'm, I'm not an advocating uh, uh, mandatory personally owned uh, accounts. Um, I, I do strongly advocate mandatory funded retirement savings. There are different ways that, that can be organized. I think that the system Australia has of, of, of mandatory employer uh, uh, pensions uh, uh, is is certainly um, a uh, uh, a good way to go, uh, depending on the particular political preferences in country. So the emphasis isn't on on, on personally owned, but on but on funded. Um, and you know this high level of interference with the funded accounts. We we have a a, a pretty high level of interference with the pay as on the pay as you go side too. <laughs> As, as witnessed by all of these reforms that have supposedly rendered these systems sustainable. I, I, I guess what, what I would argue is that if you look at both halves of the index, these systems are unsustainable. Fran France's system is not sustainable because the benefit cuts built into the system, given France's failure to fill in the resulting income gap, um, is going to lead to an erosion in the relative living standard of the elderly that will not be politically sustainable. Um, so I have a, uh, I have a, real, a real concern there. We deliberately did not add up the two halves of the index um, and present a single measure. Um, and, and, and that was because we're dealing with countries at such disparate stages of economic and social development, some that have mature welfare states and others that don't. Um, you know, you have an India that does uh, uh, poorly on, on, on adequacy, but right at the top on fiscal sustainability because it spends nothing, you know, so its average score puts it in the middle, which, um, um, which makes it comparable to a Germany, and that didn't make a lot of sense, sense to us. But it is important to look at both halves. And with, with, with that, uh, let's, let's just uh, uh, open this up for, for discussion. And thank you both very much. I really appreciate your, your p patience in um, reading the report. Thank you. Yes. Um, Richard, uh, what would you say to Dalmer's point about uh, U.S. benefit adequacy? As I recall, it's found to be high. Um, it, it, it is high uh, by the total income measure, um, and it is high uh, even by the median income measure. Uh, the U.S. does very poorly on the poverty measure. Um, um, now, it, depending depending on uh, de depending on the different uh, weight uh, you give to the indicators um, you could get a, a somewhat different somewhat different result but I, I think the, the the story in the index is that the US is vulnerable um, on, on income adequacy for lower income elders and is doing a very poor job there and in our uh, uh, reform guide where we prioritize um, the importance of different reform strategies, strengthening the poverty floor in the U.S. gets two out of three stars. So that is a, a, a real concern. Um, but when you look, we're, again, we're, we're looking, th th these aren't stylized replacement rates. We're looking at t t total income measures based on national accounts and household income, household income surveys. And when you look at the, the average income of the elderly relative to the young, or the income of the third quintile elderly relative to the third quintile young, the elderly in the United States have, have a, a ratio that is at the higher end, um, which is why they come out better in the index than you, than you might otherwise expect. Steve. Richard, just a real quick question. I'm wondering if each of you would just address a little bit this relative poverty concept. Because if you're defining poverty, and this is kind of new to me, as the percentage of your population that's below half of the median, this is really nothing more than a measure of what the variance in your income distribution is. 
if you have a really, really poor nation where nobody makes hardly anything, but they all make the same, you'll have zero poverty. But if you have a really, really rich nation that has a great variation in the level of earnings, you could have a very large percentage in poverty. So I'm not sure I'd really concur that this is the best of all possible measures of poverty. Right. Um, well, I'll, I'll comment briefly and then, and then pass it on down the line here. I, I, I agree with you, Steve, that the measure is, is problematic. And I am not advocating replacing, um, uh, however imperfect, our existing poverty line measure is in this country. I'm not advocating replacing that with a relative measure. However, in cross-country comparisons, um, the relative measure is, is a very uh, uh, useful tool, uh, which is why we I, I did not want to be in a position of defining a a absolute currency poverty thresholds in 20 different countries and projecting them over time. I would agree that's an important consideration, especially if you're looking, let's say, replacement rates are going to be going down in the future, yet, even with relatively weak growth rates 20, 30, 40 years from now, this is, could be then even a higher absolute level of real income for the elderly than we have now, and that would could change your perception of uh, whether or not systems are protecting the elderly from poverty. Right. No, I would... A report that was made in the report, and I think it's worth repeating here, is that, um, and you, I think also mentioned it, uh, Richard, in your presentation, that um, there is a real risk of an increase in poverty in countries which have reduced their, their benefits over time. And uh, it's interesting that you mentioned the UK, because the, gov the new government in the UK is going probably back to where they were before. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, you know, it, it's a, it's a, the, con the relative concept is important politically, isn't it? When people feel that a growing number of the elderly are, are falling below an acceptable level of living, then it becomes a political issue. And that I issue is emerging in countries like France, Italy, uh, where we think that, you know, poverty doesn't really exist, but the numbers are quite high. Mm -hmm. by any measure that mm -hmm. we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Um, thank you, Richard. Wonderful presentation and excellent commentaries. I have two clarifying questions. Looking at the last chart that Benedict put up, um, would it be fair to say that these are cumulative? So if you look at the U.S., you have 6 plus 12 adjustment that needs to be made. That's uh, question number one. Question number two on the poverty. Uh, has there been any attempt to uh, sort of adjust that based on housing? Because generally, older people own their housing, and if housing costs are 25 percent of the income, has there been any adjustment in that regard to adjust for the elderly having their own houses? Right. Do, do you want to go, yeah. go first? One word answer, yes, cumulative. <laughs> okay. um, Yes, I'm sure there are specialized studies that, that, that address that. Um, it, it was not possible to do that in, in, in this particular study. Um, I should note, though, that the relative poverty measures are on, the, the, are on an equivalized uh, uh, basis, meaning that they, they do take into account um, um, household size. Uh, uh, so, so, so the, the you, you, you do get economies of scale from, from living with other, other people in households, uh, but they don't actually take into account home ownership or non-home ownership and, and um, other, other factors you might want to take into account. You can imagine if you start going down that route, then you know, what's going to happen to energy costs and what do the elderly spend on that relative to the non-elderly and, and, and so on. One of the nice things about having been around the block for a while is that you get a certain perspective. And when I was a, a young official at SSA and at, uh, serving internationally, we used to go to a lot of meetings talking about a special cost of living index for the elderly. Oh, we had lots of meetings on this. You know, but no one has really done it. <laughs> there must be a reason why. Right. You should explain that. Hello, Hazel. Uh, 
Hi. I wanted to raise an issue about labor force participation, um, and I'll explain my question. We tend to talk about all those above 60 and all those below 60, thinking of them as um, groups of people that are all equal, but obviously they aren't. Um, I'm thinking of two specific areas where they're very different. And one is the participation in the labor force of women, which was very low and has been growing steadily. And the other is the young, who are taking longer and longer to enter into the productive group of labor force participants. How, you did flag very briefly labor force participation and mention it. Could you say a little bit more about how you handled this and projected it? Sure. Um, first of all, d despite the the arbitrary age cutoff between, between old and young, which we need if we're going to compare old to young over, over time. Um, the projections do, of course, fully take into account actual labor force behavior, labor force participation rates in, in each country at, at, at each age. So they, 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 they fully reflect the fact that n not all uh, young people work. Um, and that not all old people are, are retired. Um, a as to how we handled uh, the, the projections, um, the, 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 the fundamental uh, assumption underlying the, the index um, is a, a current policy and current behavior baseline. Um, um, in, in other words, we, we want to um, we, we, we want to see where we end up if we're too stupid to change course. Uh, uh, and, and by implication, be able to measure the magnitude uh, of the policy or behavioral adjustments that would be necessary uh, to achieve a more satisfactory outcome on either the sustainability or the adequacy side. Um, we, we do make a couple of important exceptions to, to, to the no the no policy change and, 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 and no behavioral change uh, uh, it, it, uh, assumption. And one of them involves labor force participation. Um, we do uh, uh, build in uh, a cohort effect. So if labor force participation um, has been rising, uh, as it has been very sharply uh, in, in Europe uh, uh, among uh, adults in their late 50s and early 60s, then, then that will uh, feed through the projections. Uh, uh, labor force participation has also been rising uh, uh, somewhat in the United States as well uh, at older ages, and not just as a short-term response to the to the the economic uh, crisis and the gutting of uh, 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 401ks and 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 IRAs. Uh, we, we also allow for um, um, increases in uh, labor force participation due to uh, policy changes, uh, uh, such as increases in normal or early retirement ages. Um, um, so to, to, to that extent, uh, in some countries, uh, the projections uh, reflect a, a, a rising, incorporate a rising trend in labor force participation at older ages. But we're not assuming um, any, we're not building in the behavioral response, um, because we want to look at uh, we we, we, we want to measure the magnitude of the response that would be required. It's a, s a s simple actuarial approach to the to the to the to the projections. Actuarial projection scenarios, Steve, as as opposed to the economists' general equilibrium black box, sir. I'm, the one point that you made earlier was the presumption of a regression to the mean on excess cost growth internationally, which yes. is, I mean, to us in the U.S., that'd be as Joyce says, a really big, you know, CBO and SSA also actually really, that, that's a pretty big deal because excess cost growth, cost growth is really big here. And I'm assuming for the U.S. and for all the developed countries, that's a real deceleration in per capita health cost growth and probably acceleration for the Well, for some, for it's an acceleration. The, the 25 year um, historical average for excess cross cost growth across the developed, I, I guess, the 10 or 11 developed countries in our index. Is is GDP per capita GDP plus uh, plus 0.5. Um, so for the U.S., that is quite a hmm? yeah. We're it, I, I, it it is, um, um, and we phase that in. Uh, uh, case of case, is it 2040 or 2050? 
Uh, the U.S. would be two or three percentage points of GDP higher uh, without that assumption. But in, in a number of countries, um, we're assuming an acceleration, uh, uh, an increase in excess cost growth. That, that's the case in, uh, I guess the U.S., France, and the Netherlands are the ones that come down. Canada comes down. Um, Sweden and a number of others go up. And the, 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 the rationale, besides the obvious thing, is that if you just, you know, run it off, it, run it out at the historical rate, you know, there's nothing left in GDP to pay for events like this um, <laughs> or anything else, right? Um, it, 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 it's that, it, it's that uh, uh, p particularly in, in, in a world in which um, um, access to information about uh, uh, health care uh, uh, is much more widely available, that, that, that countries which have up to now been more successful in keeping a lid on it are going to find that increasingly uh, uh, di difficult, where, whereas the countries that have very rapid growth rates um, are going to have pressure from the other side. But there, there, we, we have a sensitivity analysis on that in the, in the appendix, and other assumptions certainly are, are possible. Uh, Richard. Yes. Uh, hi, thank hi. you. Firstly, uh, congratulations to you and your team. It's really a great piece of work. Uh, I would suggest a uh, provides a very serious and I think even exciting analytical framework uh, for <coughs> what intuitively, as you're suggesting, we know is the case. Uh, so with that background, but it's terrific and, and congratulations. I guess my question goes directly to the uh, policy suggestions. And it, it's around whether you have any work or insights as a result of that into, uh, you know, sort of the 80-20 rules of if, let's take healthcare, for example, which uh, the, the data points out is a particular, particular challenge, to put, it, not to put too fine a point on it. Um, if one were to address, uh, you know, three or four of the critical non-communicable diseases uh, what would that do? I mean, if we were to find solutions to Alzheimer's, diabetes, cardiovascular, or if you were to start really uh, modeling, uh, you know, medical home. Uh, I mean, these are the sort of things that are the innovative solutions to, uh, you know, how we get through this sustainability question. Mm. So it, it's really, uh, and then what would, what would be, what, what it would require on the investment side? Well, I mean, in my view, Mike, that would certainly improve welfare. Uh, whether it would reduce cost growth is uh, 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 another question entirely. Um, you know, there, there are some people uh, in the audience here who are sure, surely uh, familiar with the, the concept of next competing cause of, 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 of death. You, 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 you cure uh, one ill um, um, and the, and the pop population then uh, succumbs to to, to the next competing, uh, the next competing cause of death. But I, I, I think more broadly, uh, 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 what, what's what, what's driving this excess cost growth um, is the the ability of technology to address uh, ever uh, uh, not just a wider but an ever subtler. Uh, range of, 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 of conditions. It's rising public expectations about, about care um, and, and about cure. And I, I, I see us moving into a future in, with, in which health care becomes sort of a lifelong process of, of monitoring and fine-tuning. Um, and I, 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 I mean, from, from, a, from a policy and, and, and a public health and a welfare perspective, I, I, I think we need to go at all of what you said but I'm, I'm skeptical that that, that 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 would solve the cost problem without some fundamental reform that puts a budget constraint on the system. And, and that, 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 that's my view. The other panelists may have other view. It, it, no, nobody may want to take that one on. I, uh, no, it's, no, I mean, it's a similar, I take your point. Uh, and, you know, it's the, no one ever made it out alive, so there is that, too. <laughs> But, uh, you know, to me it's a similar question as we ask on the working issues. Namely, you know, if 
68, what does that mean? If they work to 73, what does that mean? And, you know, similarly on the health side, if, you know, there, if, if we can address, uh, you know, major costs that we currently have, and we just had this study earlier this year, as many, or last year, as many know, the global cost of Alzheimer's at 604 billion. Well, you know, something may, I mean, can't, something else may develop in 20 years from environmental concerns, but I mean, that's not a small number. No, it's not. And so I'm just talking about the sustainability of these things, uh, you know, on, on the two sides. Mm -hmm. What what are the sort of numbers? I mean, I'd like to see those, and I think we have to look at them. What are the sort of numbers? What do they look like if we begin to bend these curves? If we begin to bend what it costs for the NCDs, if we begin to say, let's keep people working till you know, 67, what is active for? 73, what is active for? Mm -hmm. Those are the same questions, it seems to me. Yeah, well, we certainly made those calculations on the retirement side. Um, we, we have a, a one set of calculations. I'm not sure if they're featured in this report or not. Um, but we, we look at, uh, uh, let's say your goal is to keep pension spending, public pension spending, from rising as a share of GDP um, between now and 2040 or now and 2050. Uh, uh, what would the, how much would you have to cut uh, per capita benefits relative to per capita wages, how much, how many, or alternatively, how many years would you have to raise the effective retirement age? Um, um, the, reti the answer to the retirement age point uh, 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 ranges between seven years on the low end uh, uh, in the United States um, to 11 or 12 years on the high end in, in, in Japan. Uh, over the next 30 or 35 years, if you wanted to balance it purely uh, on that end. I mean, ra raising retirement ages to the extent that higher retirement ages are accompanied by, uh, uh, well, extending work lives, um, particularly if that's accompanied by uh, la later, ages, later ages of public benefit receipt, um, ha has, a whole, has a whole host of benefits, which is why we, we emphasize that, that solution. Uh, so so strongly. I mean, you're not only reducing benefit costs, but you're increasing contributions um, and, and, and the, tax, the tax take. Um, you're potentially making up for shortages of uh, workers at, at younger ages. Workforces are going to be growing very slowly in all developed countries are going to be, and are going to be contracting sharply in, in many. Um, so there's a broader economic benefit. And uh, uh, if we have any gerontologists in the audience, uh, uh, I'm sure they'd second me that the, uh, at least I hope they would, that the, the literature uh, bears out that uh, some continued um, degree of productive engagement at, at older ages even leads to uh, a better health and uh, 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 more, more happiness uh, uh, proxied uh, in, in, in various ways. So we've, we've done that on the retirement side. Um, on the healthcare side, one thing you do have to remember to get back to this excess cost growth point is, is that we're already building in, uh, perhaps inappropriately, um, a fair amount of uh, cost curve bending <laughs> uh, into, into these, these projections. Um, so we're going to need some significant progress um, on, on that front uh, if things actually aren't going to cost a lot more than we're, than we're projecting. Thelma? Since I was so unfair to the French, I'm going to say something in their favor now. Uh, buried in the French pension reform uh, that was adopted in November of last year is, I think, a very interesting policy innovation, uh, the kind that you're talking about. And that is the requirement that people, uh, in order to get a full benefit, have to work 41.5 years and is indexed to longevity, life expectancy. So it's expected to go up to 42, 43, 44, 45. Um, and it didn't get very much attention. And I don't think the French know the population uh, got it yet because everything was focused on retirement ages, you know, the 60 to 62, the whole thing. But uh, it's an interesting, um, I think, right. interesting innovation to uh, require, in order to get a full benefit, a longer working life, as, as you recommend. 
And, and they're, you know, in, in principle, um, you know, there's no reason why average retirement ages couldn't go up by 7 or 10 or 12 years over the next 30 or 40 years. They've gone down by that much uh, in many countries over the past 40. Um, but uh, uh, there, 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 there's liable to be, uh, particularly when these reforms are not uh, fully disclosed and advertised, um, I don't, I, uh, significant public resistance. I, I don't think many French people understand yeah. that the second tier of uh, the pension system, ARCO and AGIRC, has been price indexed. And we'll, that, that's what accounts fundamentally for that big relative, uh, that erosion benefits relative to, to, to wages. Yeah. Um, yeah. On excess cost growth, I'd be more optimistic that, I mean, if you look at uh, Japan and Germany since 2000, <coughs> health spending to GDP has been practically flat. Other countries are doing a much better job than the United States in, con in kind of converting technology into actually health care. So I think there's actually a lot to learn from other uh, countries. And, you know, of course, in the U.S., we have a large amount of research being done on how much savings you can get from health information technology, et cetera. But what's always mm -hmm. striking for us when we kind of look across countries is uh, in the U.S., I mean, the problem is there's just not the hard budget constraint there is in other countries in terms of forcing right. people to kind of stay within the budget. And even if you look, let's say, at the uh, Ryan Rivlin proposal, the CBO costed out, I mean, in a lot of ways, the essence of that is uh, in some ways reducing the rate of real growth of health spending and uh, but even that, uh, their estimate, I understand, gives you about one and a half percentage points of GDP of savings relative to the baseline of 2030. So uh, still uh, quite high an increase even after that. Mm -hmm. We have other, other questions? Yes. Thank you. Um, Richard, you were saying that you like to see funded pension systems. Yes. And I appreciate what you're saying, and I appreciate the benefits and the risks that come with that. Um, I work in emerging market countries, and the officials say, you know, we're actually leaning toward that. We see that if the money's there, then it might even go to the people that deserve it. But they always come back to, but the IMF is telling us not to do that. We can't get what we want from the IMF if we're also making a funded system. And I was just wondering if both of you would comment on that. Is there any truth to <laughs> oh, yeah. 100% <laughs> of the countries I've worked in, yeah. Go ahead. No, I mean, I meant the IMF. Yeah. I think, I mean, the issue is always this uh, in the looking at um, this trade off that, you know, whatever budget deficit you have, it has to be financed. All right. And ideally, when the second pillar was introduced, I mean, Chile was more the model, all right? If, and, uh, yeah, I'm going to quote Sandy's paper I even re read recently saying, or uh, talking about the uh, recently on this, that uh, you, know, you ideally should finance the transition to a new private scheme with uh, other fiscal adjustment. And when countries don't do that, that's when the issue becomes relevant. So the whole problem is that when you have budget deficits, they have to be financed. And so therefore, it's more this issue of uh, what is the right speed of transition to a uh, to these funded systems, but but I think also I mean the whole question is, I mean introducing new private schemes is not really a panacea in the sense of you have to fix the first pillar, you have to do something about that, and so I think there are many difficult trade-offs, especially now in an era of a cr crisis where uh, countries are already undertaking large fiscal adjustments, and the question is right. is an interesting period now to think of what is the appropriate role of these of these uh, of the of the private systems when you're undergoing a generalized uh, fiscal crisis. Yeah, I, I I concur completely. I mean, if if a if a transition to a you know an un unfunded uh, uh, first pillar to to a funded pillar is debt finance, then it isn't economically funded. Um, um, I, I I'm not necessarily advocating uh, uh, that. Um, kind of transition, which in any case in most developed countries, because of the double burden problem, um, really, you know, really isn't a starter at all. Uh, it, it might have been 25 or 30 years ago. Um, um, but, but it's possible to have a, a mandated add-on, um, which is certainly something uh, in the, that I would 
seriously consider as a policy option in the in, in the United States. It's also worth pointing out that you do need um, um, some level of financial market uh, uh, development um, um, and uh, uh, and rule of uh, protection of property rights and, and and rule of law. But but if you have that and you can move if you can shift the balance a bit more towards funded. I, I, and, and, it, and it's genuinely funded, economically funded, um, then there is a big uh, 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 potential, potential advantage. Um, in, in a pay-as-you-go system, you are a slave of your own demography. Right? The, the, the projections are driven by the change in the dependency ratio. Um, and, and, and there's no way to escape that. Um, you, know, if you, you, you either pay more or you get less. Uh, in, in a funded system, particularly uh, uh, if, if the system is free uh, to seek uh, a global rate of return, um, if it can be invested uh, uh, in an internationally diversified portfolio, th th then you can escape um, 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 at least to some extent that, that box. And so I would, I would consider that a, uh, uh, a, significant, uh, uh, a significant advantage with all of those caveats that, that I prefaced that with. Yeah. Lou. Uh, I certainly agree with the uh, great report. You've given us uh, a lot to argue about over the, the next several <laughs> years, at least. But uh, I, I just wondered, in, uh, and I agree with increasing uh, retirement age or years of work, but I wonder, does your study take into account any of the effects of uh, disability in this? Uh, are pensions for the disabled included uh, in your pension categories or the adequacy of, of uh, you know, the The, the, the pensions for the disabled are included in the other benefit category. Every, every, every government benefit um, paid to the old or young uh, is included in the projections. For the developed countries, we start with the OECD social welfare expenditure database. We have a variety of sources we use for, uh, uh, <clears throat> for emerging markets. But the, pe the, the public pensions category, uh, uh, this is true on the, for the private pensions as well, is o it's old age, retirement benefits, and survivor's benefits. Um, and the disability part, uh, to the extent uh, we were able to, uh, with the sources we were using, is included in the other benefit category. And, and we, does, does that answer the question? Well, it's just. And, and we don't make any attempt to project changes in disability rates over, over time, except to the extent that they mil may be built into the SSA projections we're using for Social Security or into the EC projections we're using for the EC countries. I mean, to the extent we, we don't, we're not projecting public pension spending from scratch for all of these countries. We're taking, uh, uh, there's a lot we are projecting <laughs> um, um, that's generated by the model. But, but that, that's, that's an input sometimes normalized, okay, uh, uh, to, to, our, to our definitions. Um, um, so, so that the changes in disability rates are, are certainly built into a lot of the public pension projections, but we're not explicitly representing that. I guess the, my question is the adequacy of the disability benefits when you're, uh, you know, you're going to have a significant increase in the disabled population by definition when you increase the retirement age. Right. And the adequacy of disability benefits is a very big question in most countries, including the U.S. Well, I very much doubt, uh, well, we, we we have somebody here who could answer the question for, for the U.S. Um, th does the well, increase? I ask, ask question, but I think what we might be getting at is the question of if you raise the retirement age, say, by seven years, right? not how long people work, but the retirement age by seven years, you'll save a lot of money in not paying retirement benefits for those seven years. But there are going to be a lot of people in that seven-year age band that you'll probably be paying disability benefits to. Right. If you're taking that into account right. in your estimation, no, okay. but 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 that's not built. In, that that's not our baseline. That that's not our baseline scenario. Okay, that that's just an illustrative calculation. But you're right. You would 
you, you would need to do. You, you would need to do an offset, absolutely. So you'd actually have to raise it by eight or nine years and to, to get the same dollar amount. Yeah. Well, and then the adequacy of the benefit. That while the U.S. benefit is certainly not high, right? Uh, it's much lower in many of the countries. The disability benefit is paltry. Right. Compared to the foundation and the right. Benefit is right. But, but again, our, our adequacy Me measures here are not simply looking at the adequacy of Social Security. If, if all most seniors had in the U.S. was Social Security, we would be doing pretty dismally uh, in these international adequacy comparisons. Uh, uh, but, you know, although it is not universal, Uh, we do have a substantial uh, uh, private pension system. We have state and local pensions. We can talk about after hours about how we han handled the unfunded liabilities there. Um, um, but th th these are sort of, we're, we're trying to look at the total economic resources available to, to the elderly and the non-elderly. Non um, and uh, uh, the, the, the numbers, one of the reasons the numbers are surprisingly surprisingly high, um, um, it may be surprisingly high to some people, the, the income ratio of, of old to young in the United States. Um, we are using a national accounting uh, uh, framework. We're not simply taking unadjusted household income survey uh, uh, data. Um, we use household income surveys to do our age allocation, um, but, but, but it's, it, it, it's a broader Uh, more comprehensive uh, uh, income definition. Just, I think, Lou, you put your finger on probably one of the uh, naughtiest public policy questions that are going to be facing many countries because, um, you know, raising the retirement age and making people work longer <coughs> is going to result in that issue that you're talking about. And uh, a lot of countries are masking it through unemployment insurance. Uh, you know, they've got special provisions for the 55 plus that they can get on the unemployment rolls more easily and so forth. So, okay, patch it up a little bit. But uh, it's clear that it's emerging as, as a very big challenge. And uh, the French, now I'm going to say something not very nice about them. Uh, they did something that was very similar to what was in one of our commission reports. And they said, we don't want to medicalize disability. This is occupational disability. It's people who can't work for some reason. So uh, the old, the old dot, yeah. figure yeah. it out, they said to yeah. the Social Security people. Yeah. And we'll pay for it from the Workman's Comp Fund. Right. To, to, to my mind, you know, France is really one of the most, and maybe the most startling story uh, 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 in the index. Our, Our adequacy measures for France are forward-looking. Our indicators are, you know, the ratio of the elder, per capita elderly to non-elderly income in 2040. If you look at, if you rank them by 2007, France is near the top, okay? It, it, what we're projecting is a very substantial erosion uh, in this retiree's paradise. I mean, elderly labor force participation in France today is overall, I think, 5%. Um, um, uh, retirement ages are young, benefits are relatively generous. Uh, 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 th this may, may change uh, uh, dramatically uh, in, in, the, in the future. Uh, I have some skin in the game, too, I guess. My wife is French, and, uh, <laughs> um, um, th though I won't qualify for a French uh, pension. Yes. Um, is it possible you're underestimating the difficulty uh, of, uh, of retaining or regaining employment if you're, say, 65? Because in this country, it's no main feat these days if you're the typical person who, say, loses a job. You can, uh, you know, spend many, many weeks looking for one, and many people will sure. simply become discouraged. And my feeling is that, you know, with a spreadsheet, you can easily change the parameters. But what has to change here is an attitude, I think, both T towards hiring older people and perhaps older people's uh, 
uh, views about what they're, what they're worth, economically speaking. And uh, neither of these things is going to change overnight. I mean, I hate the phrase ageism. Age discrimination is, I think, reasonably rampant in the United States, and, and I don't think the United States is, uh, is unrepresentative in that respect. Right. Well, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. It's, it's, a, big, it's a big challenge. Um, but, but the United States is toward the high end of the spectrum, cer certainly in the developed countries on elderly labor force participation. And we do not make that a high three-star priority for the United States. What we do is we, we have projections of elderly labor force participation out to the year 2040, given this sort of current behavior with cohort effect uh, uh, assumption. And we prioritize uh, uh, the need to raise participation rates based on the projected participation rate in 2040. And, and, and the U.S. is really toward, toward the high end um, 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 there. R raising it much higher may be, uh, uh, may be difficult uh, in, in the future. You, you can't take one of these reform strategies and make that bear the whole, uh, uh, the whole brunt of um, um, bringing, bringing the books into a, into a better balance. Um, so some countries need, I, I think, in the long run, in the very long run, to raise fertility rates. I, I, I think if you crank out the numbers for a Japan, which looks okay uh, in our index through 2040, if you crank them out to 2060 or 2070, it doesn't work anymore. The Japanese government actually projects the date there'll be only one Japanese citizen left living. Um, th this is not a sustainable, you, know, it, you can't have a sustainable, you know, long-term uh, economy and society at a 1.2 or 1.3 fertility rate. But that's not an issue in the United States. We have replacement level fertility plus substantial net immigration. Um, um, for, for the United States, uh, controlling health care costs and uh, improving the poverty floor would be the, the, the absolute top two priorities. Um, I think that, that fall out of the index. For other countries, they would be uh, quite different. Yes, I think that we could, could use a mandated uh, uh, savings-based system because I think we've amply demonstrated by this point that tax incentives only get you so far uh, and that you're just moving money from you know, one untaxed pocket into another account into another ta taxed account. Um, so I, I think that would be, that would be important, but, but that, uh, uh, bec because you have the entire, you know, bottom half of the income distribution uh, still highly dependent um, on the, the unfunded uh, first, first pillar. And, and that's, a, that's a concern going forward. And these are also the same people who will be least, probably least able uh, for the most part, to to, to work longer, uh, but but certainly the the the, the poverty concern um, and the health care cost concern are the the two biggest ones in the United States. We're, we're not at the desperation end of the spectrum here. We're uh, more at the opportunity end, except for the fact, uh, and and Benedict, you made this point very well, um, that, that 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 going into this, uh, we're we're not terribly well. <laughs> We're not. We're not. Certainly not as well positioned as we were a year or two ago. Let me shut up and just see if my two co-panelists here have a closing word or two they want to say. And uh, no, we're out. Covered. Covered the ground. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank